Welcome to today's episode and the topic of sonic footprint noise pollution created by humans. If you would like to listen to this episode on Spotify or another platform, please follow the link in the description. We're going to talk about questions like what is a sonic footprint? How do humans contribute to the noise pollution? And why is nobody aware of it? For the conversation, I invited Louis Möckel. He wrote his master thesis about the topic and will fill us in about everything we need to know. To get to know him more, you can also follow the description link to his LinkedIn account or to his Instagram account. To make it easy for you to find your most interesting topics in the conversation, I created timestamps, so feel free to jump around and do whatever you like with the episode and the content. Thank you very much for your time, Louis, and the opportunity to talk about this specific topic. A warm welcome, Louis Merkel. Hello. Hello. Let us know a little bit about you and your professional studies and your master thesis, please. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Louis. Um, and I'm currently studying in Eindhoven in a master program. It's a design master that's focusing on mainly research and the transformative potential of design. Mm -hmm. And I've chosen to work with sound. Um, I think that just came out of a personal interest because I make a lot of music mm -hmm. and I see sound as an, as an interesting medium that interconnects between people, landscapes and animals. And thus also has a very interesting uh, ecological potential, mm -hmm. as most animals actually use sound to communicate with. And since we're living in the age of the climate crisis, <laughs> ecology is, of course, a hot topic also in design. Yeah. Um, so I thought, why not combining these two topics and look into what, what can we take out of sound in regards of ecology? and what can I do as a designer for that? So yeah, I started uh, researching in what, what do we already know about sound in, in ecosystems and what, what is not known. There's actually a lot of unknown factors still because mm -hmm. uh, sound is, in, especially in natural sciences, hasn't been researched for a long time because there was just the lack of the technology to do so. Um, so it's still a relatively like thriving field that's uh, just about to grow um, and a lot of knowledge is being generated and I thought that's an interesting moment um, to also tap in as a designer um, because there, it's, it's also quite undefined still what um, like what professions are working with this medium because it's like this in-between space of uh, sound art, science, music, and everything. And, and there's a lot of perspectives and different knowledges coming from different fields yeah. whose merging can create like new knowledge about the topic of sound, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting because when I was reading through your booklet, your uh, thesis uh, proposal, I was like, Oh, that is so fascinating because I'm, of course, aware of carbon footprint. I'm aware of uh, light pollution, but sound pollution, I actually never thought about before. And people I talked to about this episode, they were always like, I never heard of that. Like, what is that? It's like everyone produces noise or sounds, but how do we even come up with the thought of how does it become a pollution? What was your way to get to that moment? Yeah. I mean, the, the idea of sound pollution is not new. It's been around for a while, um, uh, especially since Murray Schafer, who was a composer in the 70s, who uh, also invented the term soundscape, mm -hmm. which is the combination of the word landscape and sound, which basically describes the acoustic landscape of a space that is, of course, always defined by all the sound emitting elements um, that are in this space. Um, and he, he wrote a lot about the, the sound pollution of, um, urban areas and mm -hmm. divided, uh, the sounds of the world into the categories of geophony, anthropophony, um, biophony and technophony, and which describes basically the, the liveless sounds, the geophony, which are the sounds created by, by weather events or earthquakes, 
or whatsoever, mm -hmm. things that are not related to life. Then there's the biophony, which is um, describing the sounds that are created by animals, mainly animal communication and moving patterns. Mm -hmm. And then there's the anthropophony, which are all the sounds that are made by humans um, that include the technophony, um, which are the sounds that are made by machines. Mm -hmm. And those sounds are basically um, around since not a long time because uh, they, they started intruding ecosystems since the since the beginning of the industrial revolution i would say when mm -hmm. suddenly machinery came up and started to produce a lot of sound out of a sudden that was um not very common for most ecosystem like the sound of a of a steam train driving through a landscape was something that most animals living in this landscape have never heard before mm -hmm. um and that that actually can cause a problem why, why it is called pollution because these animals have developed um, organs to um, produce and perceive sound um, according to the to the soundscape they gr they grew up in in the course of evolution. Mm -hmm. So they had millions of millions of years to develop um, their hearing and their voice organs, which has created like a, almost like a composition between animals mm -hmm. um, that they can communicate in between each other without masking. And the term of masking refers to the fact that one sound is able to drown another sound mm -hmm. um, by by being either too loud or being on the same frequency range. Because if you have two sounds with the same frequency, you will not be able to differentiate between both. Mm -hmm. So most animals that live in the same ecosystem, they have developed a voice that has a different frequency from each other. So they can communicate at the same time. Mm -hmm. But now with the rise of the sound of machines in these ecosystems, um, there, there's a whole new um, new image of frequencies that um, that these animals had no time to adapt to because what is uh, the time of the industrial revolution compared to the uh, to the time of evolution basically? Yeah. So um, yeah, it's 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 a relatively new phenomenon that that just animals don't have time to adapt to. And that, and this is basically the main problem why it's considered an an ecological uh, an ecological problem, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it totally makes sense because we don't give the surrounding the time to actually have a sound evolution. I don't even think humans have that yet. Like, there's a lot of noise coming that we can't cancel out anymore. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and and I think also the fact that sound pollution is not so common is also bound to the fact that we're living in a very visual era which mm -hmm. is for example why light pollution is maybe a more common topic because mm -hmm. we are so used to perceiving the world with our eyes um, but it's interesting actually what happens if you if you really start focusing on your ears and you just take a walk take a walk um, in your own neighborhood and you realize how loud it is actually it, it can become quite unpleasant uh, once you start focusing on sound because then you realize how loud it is and then you realize how painful it actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's an interesting experience. I can recommend doing that. <laughs> Definitely. That's a really good exercise. And uh, I also think like if you get sensitive to that, for me, example, I really don't like to sleep in loud cities. When I need to travel for work, I'm like earplugs are my thing. I would never leave my home without earplugs because I know I need to have that additional sound cancelling device. Yeah. And it's really, yeah, I agree. really strange. I mean, some people do like that. The, the, mm -hmm. It's also, it's very subjective, the experience of sound. Yeah. Some people actually need noise to sleep because mm -hmm. either they're so used to it or it gives them just a general um, feeling of calmness. I mean, there's a whole universe on YouTube on videos that just create noise for people to sleep. <laughs> really? Oh, I didn't walk know that. 10 hour, 10 hour airplane noise to fall asleep. It's, <laughs> it's, um, people love that. <laughs> and I can get that because um, white noise is, um, is a very calming experience also mm -hmm. because it's, um, it's so continuous in a way. Yeah. It is super but, fascinating. Because it yeah. really just brings out my experience of when, when friends come over to my flat and I live next to the, uh, to the woods. So it's really calm and you have uh, maybe birds here. And then they move into the flat like 
they they enter the flat and it's like okay can we can we put in some music here Dagmar because it's really it's so silent they are so not used to the silence and I'm like addicted to the silence it's like oh I just want to hear my thoughts but my, sometimes I think like they also want to cancel out the the thoughts that would actually come and they yeah. use noise for that I totally agree. I think there's a strong connection between what we are thinking and what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and also, I believe it's a bit underestimated what physical effect sound also has. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there has been research and proof that, for example, people who live close to airports, um, they have an increase in cardiovascular diseases because of um, the noise putting stress to their bodies. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it's something that you might not even consider as stressful, but still there's a physical reaction that, mm -hmm. that you can somehow measure and um, measure it on humans. But I would assume that animals who have sensitive hearing, they must also be somehow affected by, by noises like airports or trains or, I mean, there's so much areas that, that create a lot of noise yeah. that they must be affected in some kind of way. Most definitely, because if you like, not just the noise itself, but if you, you cut through an ecosystem because you're building something like uh, the railway and stuff like that, you, you interfere with uh, the normal habitat of structure and sound. So it definitely has also a physical effect on the beings who already live there. I guess so. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's actually quite violent to think about sound like that mm -hmm. um, because it, it kind of doesn't leave the animals a choice to, to adapt to that. If there's a highway being built through your habitat, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be there. It, first of all, it's, it's going to be like a, a line, like almost like a wall through your habitat that you will never be able to cross. Yeah. And second of all, it will um, bombard you with noise mm -hmm. day and night <laughs> forever. Yeah. It's quite crazy. It's really crazy. And it's like, we humans maybe do that sometimes on purpose that we move somewhere and say like, yeah, it's a better connection and I don't, I don't mind the noise and we are not aware of how much it stresses us underneath, like our physical reaction to it will be stress and you would measure that through, I guess, blood pressure and stuff like that. But uh, we ignore that. We also ignore our own uh, signs for that. Is there, uh, do you have data on... Uh, when do humans perceive n sound as noise? Like, is there a decibel number or anything else where we said, okay, this is actually labeled as noise? Um, yeah, well, there's, there's um, classifications of at which loudness something is perceived as loud, when, it, when is it getting painful? So like from... 80 decibels, for example, something is already relatively loud. Then mm -hmm. from 100 decibel, it's extremely loud, which is basically the volume of, of a concert or a mm -hmm. club. And then 120 decibels is, is already super painful that you would think, oh, I need to leave here. Mm -hmm. But also, it, it's, a, it's a categorization that is very simplified because also with sound, it's so subjective. Because if I want to go to a concert, I have... Of course, I like that it's loud, but then if I want to sleep, of course, this would not be a pleasant experience. So it, mm -hmm. it's really hard to categorize um, an experience in a number, I would say, mm -hmm. because it's bound to also my personal taste, my own experiences, yeah. um, also maybe the, how well I'm, my ears are hearing. Um, it's it's based on so many factors whether I perceive something as noise or not. Um, that it's I would say it's really hard to say. Um, but maybe it's also not always important to categorize everything mm -hmm. because we can say okay it's it's not good if it's extremely loud all the time because there will be people who will be stressed from that. So we can in in general I would say we can assume that it's better to reduce the amount of noise that we're producing both in human habitats as well as in wildlife habitats. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we talked about noise. We also talked about the sonic footprint. Do you have a definition put down for yourself or from others what a sonic footprint actually is or what is it including? 
Yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, because um, the, the concept of a sonic footprint doesn't really exist yet. That was the idea for my thesis to, to start a benchmark of how to measure the sound that is created by the production of goods mm -hmm. um, in order to, to be able to measure the e ecological effect of that in the, in, in the end turn. Um, and I took the idea from existing footprint models, like the carbon footprint, for example, mm -hmm. that is already um, used quite widely and also not very often in a very wise way, I would say. Um, so the, the footprint itself, I think, has some problems because it's not always very precise, because it also needs to generalize a lot to be able to reduce the complexity of the production of one thing into one number. Um, and with sound, that gets particularly difficult because to, to measure sound, you need to consider a lot of factors like loudness, the location of where the sound is emitted, because it's it makes a difference whether the sound is being emitted in the ocean, in the air, mm -hmm. or if it's traveling through soil. That's also something we need to consider if you're analyzing the ecological potential of sound, because um, underneath the highway, for example, you also have sound mm -hmm. that's traveling through the soil. And in the soil, there's, of course, a lot of animals living mm -hmm. who will be affected by the sound that, that we will not hear because we are, our ears are bound to listening through to sound that's traveling through air. Um, but that, that's actually a very uh, important factor, um, as, or especially also in the ocean. There's a bit more research, for example, on how um, industrial noise is affecting dolphins because for them sound is an extremely important medium to orient and also to, um, to communicate with each other. Um, yeah, and then also you need to find uh, the data about the production of an object um, to, to find out which sounds are, are even produced by making that and which sounds are produced by making the raw materials for that object and so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so mm, what I'm doing right now is basically just opening up the idea of saying, okay, we can look at objects and say, there's sounds that, that we can trace back to the production of this object. And if we want to analyze the ecological consequence of this object, we need to look at sound, not just water consumption and not just CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. um, but a categorized idea of a footprint for sound doesn't exist yet, I would say, because it, it requires a lot of classification work still to say, okay, which which ecosystem is affected by which kind of noise? Um, how far does the, does the sound travel depending on which medium it is traveling through and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't give a very precise definition on that yet because I think that would be a bit sketchy at this point. There's still, we're still in the beginning <laughs> yeah. of trying to build that sonic footprint. But nevertheless, it already creates awareness, which is a good thing that you uh, think about more things than uh, air quoting that just a carbon footprint or water pollution or anything else. And I think you did that in a very beautiful way that you chose to say like, okay, you have a toy, a dolphin toy, and how is that created and uh, put into being a toy and then moved from China to Europe or anywhere else? And how is that creating noise or noise pollution? Can you uh, give us a little bit about that, how the process uh, went down and how did you came up with that? Yeah, yeah, I try, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of irony, I have to say. <laughs> Um, because it's a great uh, tool for storytelling and, and designers are always obsessed with uh, storytelling um, of how to convey an idea of what, what they have. Um, so I, I came up with this toy because uh, they're produced um, by a company that sits in my hometown and I used to play with them a lot as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I thought, ah, dolphins are so interesting because there's first of all there's a lot of research on the acoustic communication of dolphins mm -hmm. and also there's a lot of research on the effect that 
technophonic noise has on dolphins, like the noise of ships or the noise um, that is emitted by the search for oil. Because um, as you might know, there's to, to find oil in the deep sea, um, there are ships driving with seismic air guns, that's how it's called, who produce a lot of noise um, that's basically reflecting at the bottom of the sea from the oil bed back to the ship. Mm -hmm. And through these reflections, um, uh, I don't know how the profession is called of the people who do that, but uh, these people can then find or locate the, the oil field. Mm -hmm. And that's the process that goes for, for one to four months in total of a ship um, penetrating the sea with, with volumes of up to 200 decibels. Mm -hmm um to find that oil and the, and there's proof that that has a lot of um effects on, on marine mammals like dolphins and whales um so i chose the dolphin as a storytelling object like the toy dolphin um because the because it's made of pvc which we need this oil for that mm -hmm. we produce a lot of noise to find it um and then look into how this is actually entangled with the life of the real dolphin Mm -hmm. uh, because there's this irony in it that we are producing little toys, representations of nature for children to play with. And the, the manufacturer of these toys is actually claiming on its website that by playing with them, children learn for their lifetime about sustainability by creating empathy for animals or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But by making these toys, we're actually hurting the, the animal that this toy is representing so much that that it it kind of showcases the irony of the relation to ecosystems that we have developed or mm -hmm. like what what an idea of nature we have in a late capitalistic world um, and how how sustainability is approached by companies that make plastic toys for example who which I believe don't can't have a lot to do with sustainable thinking yeah um yeah but but that's how i came up with the idea of a toy dolphin um because it yeah it just lets you really look nicely into the way how sound is entangling a production with the ecosystem that the production is taking place in and mm -hmm. um, yeah especially since they are produced in china actually they also get shipped to europe and ships are one of the main sources for marine noise um, and the noise levels in, in the sea are increasing massively. Um, I mean, you can assume the more traffic there is, the more noise there is. And of course, the traffic is increasing nonstop. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's a lot of elements to the production of this, of this plastic toy that, that you can look into, uh, where you can derive an idea of what sounds are being created from that. Um, and yeah, how, how that is basically affecting the... The habitat of the dolphin yeah and it was a brilliant move i really really like that because uh like you said the irony of we try to call it sustainable and we uh, show you the habitat of a dolphin and what a dolphin is but meanwhile to produce it we kind of uh, destruct the ecosystem and everything that was like I, I wasn't <laughs> imagining that, like, how do I explain that to a child? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit mean to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, I've maybe, maybe approach... mean, but it's important. It's important. <laughs> yeah, I believe so, too. Yeah, it's, it's really... Because when I see, uh, for example, maps of um, the, the ways where ships go and how often they pass through and they create that through different colors and basically you can't see the ocean anymore because there are so many lines yeah. drawn between the harbors it's like whoa and it's the same with yeah. airplanes it is yeah. really uh, strange how much humans have the desire to move moving itself yeah. and as your body is a cool thing but the long distance thing is something very interesting um, that we do and how much pollution we create through that not just noise pollution yeah yeah exactly yeah especially not moving ourselves but moving things mm -hmm. <laughs> that exactly. we want exactly. like the ship that transported the dolphin <laughs> to 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 europe that mm -hmm. had maybe 40 people on board and the rest was the ship itself that it need to carry its own weight of steel plus mm -hmm. the containers that it was transporting <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's a bit absurd but yeah 
It's crazy. And I think we forgot that very often because uh, like you already said, you know, you have the internet page or you have the packaging of the toy in the end and nothing is telling you about that. Maybe they use a green packaging with leaves and then water and everything looks pretty, but that is not the reality you see in the places where it's produced, where it's shipped and stuff like that. So um, that brings me to the topic of uh, what is actually sustainable. We very often use that word. And every time I ask companies that I talk to and they claim they are sustainable, I always ask like, what is your definition of sustainability? Because if you do that as a company, how is that sustainable? So for me, it became a word everyone is using, but I always ask the question of, do you know what it means for you? Like what is sustainable for you, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question um, <laughs> that I prefer to answer with saying that I think the word sustainability has lost its agency mm -hmm. uh, because it's just overused. Um, we, we can actually, that's why I was a bit skeptical with the word of, uh, of the footprint before also, mm -hmm. because the same happened actually with uh, the concept of, of footprints. It, it, that's also another... <laughs> I want to laugh about it, but it, it's quite ironic that the company BP, who was mm -hmm. also responsible for the Deepwater Horizon disaster, uh, this company actually made the concept of the footprint um, uh, successful in 2004 mm -hmm. with their uh, campaign, I think it was called the Personal Footprint Calculator or something, where you could calculate the, the Sony, the... CO2 footprint mm -hmm. of your lifestyle based on your person. And through that, the, um, the idea was generated that the responsibility for climate change doesn't lie in the hands of this company, mm -hmm. but in the consumer, because you can calculate your own footprint and you can change your behavior. So the company doesn't need to, they're just providing um, basically all the goods that you can have to to have a good life, but you don't need to buy them if you want to have like a low footprint, mm -hmm. which is a very mean marketing trick to like to flip the coin of who is responsible here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think a similar thing happens with the word sustainability that um, it's just an abused marketing word now that has nothing to say anymore because also it's, it's not defined enough in what it actually says. I mean, define what is sustainable, mm -hmm. but it, it comes from looking at what it means for something to last long or for something to be able to, um, to sustain itself for the future. But what does that even mean? But what do we want to sustain here actually? Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone needs to find their own answer to that. It's, it's, uh, I think it's too, the word is just too general. Yeah. Um, to be used as a as a motto maybe mm. that's that's a good point really to say like okay most of the time companies or people just uh, use it as a motto and by using it they uh, try to make things look okay but even though they are not okay and that is very fascinating to me because um, you already said that with uh, when bp started to create the carbon footprint and switch the coins to the consumer um it's, it's not really a blame shifting, but it's like, uh, it's a lack of responsibility. That's how I always feel it. Like nobody wants to take the responsibility. Yeah, that's true. I mean, who would want that, right? <laughs> if, <you're, laughs> if your main business is also selling <laughs> uh, crude oil, <laughs> Would you want to take the responsibility for the carbon offsets of that? <laughs> that is that is the thing I mean, that I I do understand that from the company's perspective, but also they actually make money with that because if you do produce any kind of oil or stuff, you have insurance, and if you have a disaster, they're insured for that shit. So they're calculating to actually create disasters. This is something that really pisses me off, and. Yeah. So they, there is a huge lack of responsibility and I, I really don't understand how that can always pass you by, like literally boiling it down to the fact that is a human working in that industry. And for me as a transaction analyst, I'm always like, how can a human work in an industry like that? That is for me just 
always the question like, wow, oh, I couldn't even sleep at night. But for them, it's like, it's, it's so normal. It's like, no, I just work here. I don't care. I don't mind. Yeah. Like, yeah. Hmm. A different set of thinking, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, th I think a lot of people working in this industry might think that for now, there's anyway, no alternative solution for, mm -hmm. for fuel or for plastic or for all the things that we make of crude oil. I mean, <laughs> it's countless. Um, so they say, yeah, but if we stop, um, taking oil, we can't uh, continue with our lifestyle, <laughs> which I would believe is a good thing actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe that's the, like a way of how they find excuse to what they're doing. Yeah. And this is again, uh, uh, the parallel process to not taking responsibility because what would happen if I would change my lifestyle? Like, what do I need to do differently? And we often, very often have the narrative of, oh, we need to uh, get short of something and we don't have that anymore and we do not have access to this anymore. And this is how we're basically spiraling down into fear. And then if you actually sit your ass down and think like, what do I need to change in my lifestyle to still have that, but not use that, you will find alternatives and you would be surprised how many alternatives there are. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I would, yeah. I would maybe call that optimistic creativity yep. to look like into <laughs> to look into solutions of how to have a nice life mm -hmm. <laughs> without all the stuff that we have, but like with an alternative that uh, that I might also like. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I can maybe relate to the energy crisis and heating less this winter. Now I, yeah. I started really liking to heat less. Because I don't have this uh, moment of going out and freezing to death and also going inside and putting five jackets off because it's so warm. Yeah. And now it's, uh, and I, I'm not freezing sitting in my home. I got used to just sitting in a cold flat and that's totally mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> yeah. It's strange how fast our body can adapt, isn't it? Yeah. And also strange that we need a crisis for that to realize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the irony again, the irony. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere yeah but it, but in terms of uh of the responsibility of uh of big business uh like bp i think there's also a lack of policy making i mean mm -hmm. it took us until last week to find um to find an international agreement on the protection of the open sea mm -hmm. there, there was just such a lack of um of policy making on how to protect this ecosystem which we have absolutely no idea about what's going on there's still mm -hmm more research on outer space than on the deep sea. Um, that, that this also gave way to, to companies to just extract um, a lot of resources from this ecosystem without being held back by, by international laws because still the, the open ocean doesn't belong to anyone, which is actually a good thing, but then also who is protecting it? Yeah. That is uh, most of the time the problem and that's like, if you don't have the protection, somebody can just literally raid the whole entire ecosystem. Yeah. And that's again, is actually a, a sad irony in itself because the fact that we talk about protection already positions us mm -hmm. as, as a human species, as a threat to the ecosystem we're living in. Um, the fact that this has become the way we are thinking that we need to protect <laughs> ecosystems from us yeah. that, that perfectly showcases the relationship we have developed, I think, um, instead of trying to find ways of coexisting. Um, so yeah, may maybe a new way of looking in, in how we should live is not to talk about the word sustainability, but to talk about the word what is ecological, like how do we find ecological coexistence um, in, in, in the world that we're living in and how can that also adapt to the specific um, localities because every place is so different that you can't have international laws on how to manage ecosystems. It, it, it really needs to be site specific, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And also I have to say from my own experience, the moment you have rules and you are a company, you find loopholes. 
always. So uh, people who do make these policies, they need to be very creative because uh, if you can still do certain things uh, that are okay with the law, you still haven't protected anything. But I really like the, the thinking of the measurement of we need to think about protection from us as humans is already very important to think about and talk about that we are the threat to the system, not the system is a threat to us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's actually creating like an, also this spiral of uh, we are doing bad things. So we need to protect um, the ecosystem from the things we are doing um, so we can keep on doing what we are doing because we are protecting the ecosystem. And then we have created these the, this loop of of selling CO2 certificates so we the industry can keep running um, yeah. because we are protecting the ecosystem in another place. And that keeps keeps the spiral um, like rolling basically yeah um it, it, it sometimes i compare it with the sale of indulgence that had the the church did in the middle ages where you can just pay off your debt by giving money to the church mm -hmm. you can now pay off your co2 debt to the climate by paying a, a higher price on on your flight but that's not how it works <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean the 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 amount of co2 that i'm emitting will remain the same or will maybe even increase yeah it, it, it's actually counterproductive the, the, this way of thinking, I think. Yeah, and, and people and... aren't aware of that. They're just like, uh, I have a better conscience doing that. Because uh, I know that from an organization where uh, when I was traveling, they always, um, like the amount of traveling I did with the kilo kilometers, they just send that amount to a company and then you pay money for offsetting that. And I'm like, yeah, but it's still there. I still produce that CO2. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you could, if, if you would now compare that with sound, it becomes super absurd because mm -hmm. you can, in the same way that you're looking at the amount of CO2 that you're emitting by 100 kilometers of traveling by car, mm -hmm. you can also say how much sound this car emits in 100 kilometers. Yeah. Well, could you offset that sound? No, it's mm -hmm. it's been there. <laughs> you cannot undo sound. It, it, it's impossible. So. I don't know, maybe someone will come up with a concept for that one day. I would be curious, but I, <laughs> it will be a great marketing concept in the matter of I whitewash the sound and then it's not existing anymore. Like the most things we're doing all the time when marketing comes into place. Yes. Mm, fascinating. But that's also a good thing when someone is asking me again about this uh, offsetting things and say, like, can you offset sound? That is that is a good counter argument. Thank you for that right now. It's like, and that makes them think. It's like, well, fuck, I never thought about that before. Now she got me. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't know how to offset sound. I no, mean, there's me a, you can cancel sound by, like, you have this technology of emitting sound um, and therefore, like, canceling out the volume. Mm -hmm. um, this technology is used in, in, noise cancelling headphones for example that yeah. they're producing the same frequency that the noises around you has and thus it kind of gets eliminated <laughs> like technologically that will be the only idea i could have to like it, like stop sound from being emitted but you, yeah. you can't do it that's another inter interesting thing about sound is uh it, it's ephemeral it's once it was there um you you can't like you can't trace it back because it's there for a moment and yeah. that's it. Um, whereas CO2 or water, if, if, if it's emitted or polluted or whatever, you, you can still like find that. Like CO2, you can even find in a hundred years in the atmosphere. And later. So we emitted now. Yeah. Like from, uh, from centuries ago when we have ice core drills or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The, that's a, that's an interesting way of looking into the past and like find information about the climate but but for sound that's not possible so you can't really undo the sound that has been emitted in the past but also you're not able to find out information about about the sound of the past i mean there, there's a whole field also researching in the sound of of the prehistoric era i think it's called uh, paleoacoustics Scientists trying to find out how the world sounded like before, before there was uh, ways of recording it, basically. Fascinating. Uh, and, and there's a few tools that, that you can use. For example, scientists uh, re recreate the 
resonance chamber of the skull of a dinosaur and thus are able to create the the sound that this dinosaur was making uh, but it, but it's very constructed and and still you don't really know how the world sounded like because also the atmosphere was different so mm -hmm. the sound was traveling different because it's really bound to the density of the gas uh, that it's traveling through and there's like a multitude of sound emitting elements always in in any ecosystem so it's this information that we don't we can't get somehow yeah to find out how, how did the world sound like a million years ago nobody knows <laughs> yeah but it's it's really a, a fascinating thing to think about that i just right now thought that a skull is not is not working because you have resonance bodies in your whole body when you're making sounds like our vocal cords and stuff so basically they need to reproduce the whole entire dinosaur that would already be fun to me that's like yeah. okay cool but it's really interesting, especially the thing you said with the noise cancelling uh, headphones. I was like, oh, I never thought about these either. It's like the noise is there. We're uh, cancelling the noise with another noise. And it's like, yeah, but the noise never disappears. So that is interesting. What effect does that have on humans? Because the noise itself is there. And you may be not hearing it, but how is your body reacting to it? That would be yeah. Yeah, well, technically, it's it's kind of disappearing. You can look at the, you can basically look at it as two sound waves mm -hmm. that hit each other in a way that they cancel each other out. So, the principle of noise cancellation is really um, to cancel the vibrations in the air. So it's actually making sound disappear. Okay, but um, is that down to zero? Because I, I do understand the no. concept of two. Well, yeah, that, that's the thing. I think you're, you're counseling uh, out the ability of you hearing it, but the wave, even if it's a, a lower frequency, then there's still a wave. And I had a further education three weeks ago about biogeometry and uh, compression waves and stuff. And I was like, oh, thinking about that and how compression waves still carry a lot of information, but we don't use it actually for information, but it's still there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It, it's not able to to cancel out like every entire sound. It, it's, it's able to make it more quiet. But yeah, it, it's actually a very interesting approach in general to look uh, at the concept of a wave mm -hmm. um, as an ontology to explain the world. Mm -hmm. um, because also the string theory says that, that everything is vibrating and yeah. sound is a vibration in itself. So if you look, if you start looking at things as a vibrating matter, you can sort of try to explain like a, a lot of principles through the concept of vibrations and waves um, beyond the concept of sound. I mean, mm -hmm. sound is the concept of something that that, that an ear can perceive, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting approach. There has been also research on on how sound has shaped uh, the like how do you say the visual appearance of of marine animals. Oh, um, interesting. It, I wouldn't. It, it's not very scientific, but I, th I still think it's an interesting approach because what they did is they put sound on a speaker, and if you put that speaker in a certain frequency the sound, uh, the water uh, starts vibrating mm -hmm. and creates a shape. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a standing wave, basically. And, yeah, and you, I saw that you, as in the video. Yeah, and you get these beautiful patterns of, mm -hmm. of like water that is shaped by sound. And then people took these images and compared them with the shape of some some kind of animal that lives in the in the bottom of the sea mm -hmm. and and they found a lot of similarities in the shape of that but uh the research didn't go further and there, there's it didn't go really to the point where they could prove something but still i think it's an it's an interesting idea like to think like that <laughs> to say ah, how does sound actually shape things also absolutely and this is basically if you read the books of dr ibrahim karim he's just making that the, the law of harmonics and how sound is creating our reality and that was mm. so fascinating to me because it's a completely different approach not like i look at a plant and see it's a beautiful plant but what is the source of the plant and it's like ah oh, never yeah. thought about it if that is a vibration that some at some point also creates 
any kind of noise or sound. And then yeah. the plant is there and it looks the way it looks. Or an animal in deep sea looks like the standing wave that we pre produced in a pool or anything else. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting approach, definitely. Yeah. And it also shows how little we know. Oh, my goodness. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and sound, there's a lot to find out still, I believe. Yes, yes. And there's so much, I mean, because I just remembered that when you said there's a white noise and stuff like that, and you can listen to that on YouTube to fall asleep. But there are also videos on YouTube where you do not hear anything, but it's still for you to fall asleep. But there is something as a vibration underlaying, but hmm. you, you can't really perceive it, but still it calms you down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, frequencies that the human ear cannot perceive, but mm -hmm. the body can. Um, for example, infrasound. I mean, the human ear, it can hear frequencies between 20 hertz and around 20 kilohertz, mm -hmm. decreasing by, by the age. Um, but the sound spectrum is, of course, much larger, like the same like light. We can't see ultraviolet light mm -hmm. or infralight with our eyes. And same with sound. But for example, again, the dolphin is using ultrasound uh, at around 150 kilohertz, which is way beyond the human hearing range mm -hmm. to orient itself. And in, uh, it's called echolocation, the same principle that bats use to orient themselves. Um, and, and the reflection of these sound signals helps them create a three-dimensional image um, of their surrounding. So for them, sound is also very much related to spatial perception, basically. Um, or the blue whale, for example, is using infrasound to communicate um, because the deeper the frequency, the further it travels because it's uh, more rich in energy. And therefore, whales have somehow developed a natural form of telecommunication that lets them uh, listen to each other for thousands of kilometers through mm -hmm. the ocean. There's also this um, specific depth in the sea because in spe in, especially in water, the traveling distance of sound is varying by temperature, salinity, and, and a few factors. And there's a, a specific depth, it's called the so far channel. Mm -hmm. Sound can travel much further than in other depths. And, and this depth is used by whales to communicate because um, through in there, they can really hear each other over super long distances. Um, and also in the frequency that the human cannot hear, it's like yeah. around five to 10 Hertz, which is super, super low. Um, but also that is again being interrupted by industrial noise, like, uh, like seismic air guns that are searching for oil, for example, because they also produce a lot of low noise that it can travel far. So what, what this basically does is it cuts the communication of whales mm -hmm. um, that usually can communicate um, in a long distance. And then again, they, of course, they use communication to also find mating partners. Mm -hmm. So if, if we cut that communication, we're actually endangering these animals from reproducing. Um, and especially in Wales, where there's a lot of endangered species, this is a big problem. Absolutely. And I just, I just thought, like, how do you translate that to human lives? It's like if you would cut down our internet and then you would also cut down Tinder and people would really hate that. But yes. we are doing it to, wave, uh, to whales. Yeah. To yeah. Oh. <laughs> we need to think about that, true. Yeah. Wh whale Tinder. <laughs> whale Tinder. Yeah, but it's really like, uh, I was just thinking about that because um, I don't know if it was uh, the Aborigines or other native, um, native uh, peoples um, who had... I think it's called a sound or melody wave. And it's actually the same thing you're describing for dolphins and for whales, that they communicated over distance of days. And then they say they're going to, with a specific frequency, say like sing that frequency to say, we're going to meet at that spot in three days. And everyone was meeting at that spot. And it's like crazy. Mm. We had that ability too in a certain matter of time. And now we can't do that anymore. Yeah. Well, I think there we also need to consider the cultural differences and how ways of communicating have evolved over uh, over the de development of this specific culture and yeah. also how maybe also the, the physical abilities of people are adapting 
um, to the culture that they're developing. Mm. So I'm, I'm not sure how much we can compare the and the Aboriginal way of communicating through sound with our ability to to perceive sound, but definitely there's um, uh, I, th I think our auditory perception is much more sensitive than we actually believe. Mm. There, there, there's a lot that that we are not thinking of the whole time. What things that we are perceiving, but we don't realize that we are perceiving them mm -hmm. up to the moment where we start maybe thinking of ah, I should maybe like sharpen my senses. It's the same with smell. If you train your nose yeah. to smell, you start like become a bit more sensitive to smell. And the same happens uh, if you train your ears to listen. Um, you're, you're more easily disturbed by, by noise or you can um, differentiate more easy between different sounds yeah. that, that you're hearing. And it's also so interesting. And most of the time we do that when we have accidents or anything happens to us, because I thought about uh, the one person who um, who's actually blind and uh, who's also doing uh, a clicking noise to create yeah. the surrounding around him. And he's bicycling through Berlin. And I was like, I can hear and I can see and I wouldn't even want to bicycle through Berlin. And he's just doing that with that <laughs> clicking noise. And it's like, this is very impressive. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. That's very interesting indeed, yeah. A friend also told me once of, of a guy who was building speakers mm -hmm. and he he was crazy about sound. He could he could hear if there was like a little element sticking out of, of the mm -hmm. case of the speaker because mm -hmm. it was disturbing the sound just by listening to it. Yeah. So for him also sound already became a, like a perception of space in a way. But yes, when you only focus on this sense, you can really see what it can actually do, yeah. like how, how sensitive it actually is. And every one of us can train that. It's like, it's really amazing what our brain is capable of doing, how cells like not recreate, but they readapt. like, okay, this was actually uh, for a completely different purpose, that cell. And then it's like, it becomes a hearing cell to support that because you're training it. So that is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Nice. You already started uh, with saying what is actually uh, the consequent of noise pollution um, with uh, we disturb the orientation of whales or dolphins and we also um, change their mating pattern or they're not mating at all. Is there anything else that we already know about the consequences of noise pollution? Mm, with animals, it's, mm -hmm. a diff it's a bit difficult. There has been research on the effect that, that noise has on crickets. It's the mm -hmm. same same effect. Funnily enough, crickets have um, a similar organ to hear than dolphins have. They also can hear in an extremely high frequency. Mm -hmm. And they obviously also use sound for mating. I mean, the, the warm summer nights that are filled with the sounds of crickets, those are all um, crickets trying to find a partner. And there has been research on how this is being disturbed by crickets who live next to highways, for example, that they have actually fewer reproduction because most likely they, they, they have more difficulties of um, finding each other through sound. Mm -hmm. um, and especially in the, in the course of the extinction of insects that is, that is going on that I, I also think is lacking a lot of attention. We keep talking about the mammals, uh, I keep talking about dolphins, but actually insects <laughs> have a massive decline in biomass all over the world um, since since the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And sound could be one of the elements contributing to that, actually. Yeah. And there has been also a research back in the days where someone um, researched the, the effects of infrasound, like the, the sound that is super low um, on on lava that live in the ground because many insects they breed under the ground um, mm -hmm. as and spend a, a, a time there as lava and they they also had fewer reproduction if they were exposed to infrasounds and there has been also research um, that mines for example um, to relate back to the toy dolphin to make pvc we just we need P, uh, crude oil but also rock salt mm -hmm. and rock salt is mined um, with um, uh, with blasting, 
So we just um, bombard <laughs> a mountain and take uh, salt out of it. Mm -hmm. And this is creating infrasound that is traveling through the soil, um, which, which might in the end also again affect um, insects who are living there because yeah. all soils in the world are basically alive. <laughs> Definitely. Is yeah, but... Uh, yeah. Sorry, say. No, I was like, if you take, uh, I think it is like two handful of uh, soil, you have more organisms in there than in the, uh, on in the whole planet or something like that. So we, we just don't see yeah. it, but it's all alive. That's true. Yeah, those are mostly microorganisms. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any research that sound has, like of the effect that sound has on microorganisms. Maybe it does. It would be interesting to research, actually. Definitely. Um, but yeah, it's true. Like soil is is incredibly alive. But yeah, in general, it's uh, there's not that much research on the the acoustic effect on animals. Uh, at least not as much as on humans. I mean, mm -hmm. for for humans, we already have a lot of regulations on how loud things can be in certain places at which time of the day. There's regulation for industrial areas about daytime and nighttime residential areas. And if, uh, if like a highway is too loud, for example, there needs to be measurements to protect the people living there from the noise. Mm -hmm. um, but there are no such regulations on animals because first of all, I guess there's a lack of interest. And also there's, um, there's just a, a lack of knowledge also to, mm -hmm. to know what effect it actually has. So, and I yeah, think the, we, we miss out the, the, the thinking of, okay, we need all these micro, uh, microbes and stuff. Like I just thought about if I would go into my garden and just uh, put two speakers and blast my compost pile all the time, how would that affect my compost pile and would it break down? Uh, breaking down meaning uh, it doesn't really produce earth anymore because they are so disturbed and they do not do their actual work. So that would definitely in the end also have conflicts or problems for us humans like the thing with uh, if bees just die out and we just have pollinating bees that are basically managed by humans because the wild insects are even more important to us and not the colonies we have as humans so yeah. all of that produces a wave of we are not getting food anymore and uh, unfortunately nobody's thinking about that that's my feeling all the time yeah yeah, that's a, a very crucial element. I, I totally agree. Like, mm -hmm. how how do we get food, and also how how is maybe sound affecting that process? There was this weird campaign one one summer where a German beer brand was selling a sound pills, and they were like um, putting a sound system on the hop fields, okay. and you could upload songs that they would play on the hop, and then they would make beer out of that hop that was um, sonified with the songs that you chose. I, I think it's a it's an absurd idea to to put speakers into the landscape <laughs> and penetrate it with, with random music to make beer. Um, but I would really but yeah. like to know if there was a different in taste in that beer. Exactly. I think that's a, that to find out would be interesting. Yeah. Oh, and funny. maybe even to find out which frequencies or also, if there's a relation to harmony of sound, how does that affect your compass, for example, also? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know of any research uh, that was done in this field, um, but it could, it could be interesting to find out, actually. We put it in the field now, so maybe someone <laughs> is picking it up and downloading it. That would be amazing, because even though <laughs> I would put speakers in front of my compost, that also doesn't mean that would be a noise that I could hear. They would just stand there and everyone would think she's strange, like always. Why are there speakers next to the compost? But nobody's hearing it because that is maybe a really beneficial frequency that I'm admitting onto my compost now. And now it breaks down in half of the time. That could also be a possible solution if yeah. we really research sound and waves on microorganisms. Could be, yeah. I mean, there is tools that emit ultrasound and they claim to be good against mosquitoes. 
because apparently they don't like ultrasound or like a, a, a range of insects. I haven't tried that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how, how that works or if it works, but apparently ultrasound is, is already used as a, as a tool to, to control insects basically in a way. There are things I'm going to try out in my garden this summer. Unbelievable. That is also something I will try out because I have always so many mosquitoes and it's so annoying because they eat me alive. It's like, poo. Yeah. That would be interesting. But I want to keep my dragonflies and I want to keep the birds and everything else. So I need to have a frequency that just works on mosquitoes. Yeah, I think that's always the problem with utilizing something that yeah. you create an effect. And that is always also, there's always a collateral effect on something else um, that, that some other species might benefit from, actually, or might also be disturbed from. Um, and then they probably but, uh, just take the chance of me being the only species that is not benefiting and being eaten alive. <laughs> I mean, with everything we do, I, I think we cause an effect and a collateral effect. Yes. That, that's the principle of... Of, of ecology also and that everything has an effect on each other um, and some some things that always benefit some things that always uh, lose but, the but yes, part. Mm. I, I think in some sense sound is at least a less violent way of intruding in a system than putting chemicals for example yeah because it's it doesn't has this like it doesn't remain there's no substances that remain mm -hmm. in the ground for example yeah it's a one-off thing, and if you turn it off, it's gone. Yeah, there might be an effect still, but it's not that in a hundred years you still see traces from the sun. Yeah, or maybe you do, and we just don't know yet. <laughs> Could be, yeah. Maybe you have traces. They are just different from what we would expect because we haven't understood that that is a combination to sound. Yeah. So that's really a very interesting, very interesting field. So, um. Is there anything you looked at to show how you can create kind of an ecological understanding for sound in society as an outlook of your thesis? Mm, yeah, that's a good that's a good point actually. Um, well, I'm I'm a designer, so I'm always interested in like how I can curate this idea to make it tangible in some way. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm a musician, so I love media that that carry sound. So what I'm working on right now is um, to release a record that is containing um, the research, because I've done a lot of field recording with a hydrophone and a, and a stereo microphone mm -hmm. in different places that are related to the production of that toy dolphin. Um, and then I'm, I'm speaking to, to a bioacoustic researcher. Like bioacoustics is basically the merge of biology and acoustics, a field mm -hmm. to research the acoustic behavior of animals. Um, I'm, speaking, I'm, I'm speaking to musicians who are um, really good at working with samples. And I'm trying to find a way of how these fields can start informing each other mm -hmm. to, uh, to understand sound in a, in a broader sense without be it being just a scientific perspective of it, of it or just a musicological perspective of it or just a philosophical perspective on on the sound itself um, because i think that's the that's the agency that design has in these days mm -hmm. maybe we don't necessarily need to produce a lot of um, goods anymore we can um, use design thinking as a tool to interconnect um, disciplines and therefore create um, create knowledge basically um, so yeah there, there, there will be this vinyl um, that will contain the research that you, you will be able to listen to um, and what I'm hoping to do with this is to actually generate funding to deepen the research in this field mm -hmm. uh, that will be like the overall goal of this of this project um, and from there, maybe start getting an understanding of what what can we do to to do maybe more noise control, for example. Um, because I also had this idea of okay, what if I go to the supermarket and 
all the products that I can buy there, they have like a sonic footprint on them and I can see which object has created more sound because mm -hmm. for example, if I go into the um, fruit section, the bananas that come from Brazil, of course, cause more noise than the apple that comes from the farm next door mm -hmm. because they've been shipped here. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much more transportation involved. There's like heavy noise pollution um, related to objects that we are importing. Um, but again, due to the lack of understanding of, of sound and, and the effects of noise pollution and how to even like calculate a sonic footprint, uh, I would say it's way too early to come up with a proposal to solve this problem. Because if I haven't understood the problem correctly, it, it, it can become quite sketchy if I'm coming up with a solution for it. Yeah. Um, so as of now, mm, I'm, I'm a bit careful with saying what we can do because I, I just see the problem that there still needs to be so much more research and, and more understanding on the topic before we can come up with a, with a problem solving thinking. So what I'm doing for now is basically just collecting and collecting and collecting and like start generating this idea of saying, ah, let's look into the noise that is created by our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, with the goal of just deepening the research in that field. I like that. And I have a funny thing. <laughs> it's like when you said that with the supermarket, I was just uh, imagining the QR code next to a banana and you're <laughs> clicking on that QR code. And your audio starts and it's just screaming at you. <laughs> and the apple is just saying, hello. <laughs> I couldn't stop. That could be a creative interpretation of the sound footprint, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, because uh, the, the question again, like what is your understanding of noise uh, or of uh, sound itself? And uh, what would you like or what would you don't like? And <laughs> that was the first thing that popped to mind. <laughs> Yeah, but then maybe someone will come and say, I'm a metalhead. I really like the screaming banana. I'm <laughs> exactly. only going to eat bananas now. <laughs> <laughs> Good happen. Good happen. <laughs> really interesting. So what is your, your wish for the future? Like, uh, what would you like to see, especially also regarding to a sonic footprint or the research of, uh, of all of that? Yeah, I, th I think my, my big goal is to um to generate the understanding that sound uh, is a medium through which we can think mm -hmm. through which we can see connections of actions connections of animals between us and the landscape we are living in um and therefore um discover the ecological potential of sound a bit further um and and, and thus also create uh, like maybe a, an auditive sensibility that, that is a bit widening. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I really don't like if I go, for example, to, to a venue and there's bad sound because mm -hmm. that speaks for me that someone didn't really consider the sound quality of this venue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bad thing, but I want to listen maybe to, to a musician performing there. It's all about sound. Yeah. Why does no one think about the sound quality? Um, so I, I really would like to generate a, a, a wider understanding of the importance of sound and, and it, it can go in many directions. Like, I mean, the sound quality of a, of a concert is a very, very egoistic motivation, <laughs> of course. <laughs> But then, uh, yeah, I think we, we can discover a lot of potential if, if we start looking at sound a bit further and if you're training our ears to be more sensitive. Um, just in a, in everyday situations, walking mm -hmm. through the city and listening to the noise that is surrounding us. Um, because that I believe is the, is the baseline for, for action. If, because if no one's realizing that something is disturbing, no one's going to do something about it. But then if people start saying, ah, this is so annoying. Can we like, abandon cars or like have no more cars in the city center mm. because they're just too loud it's not even about the 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 climate or like the co2 emissions that they have it's also about the sound mm -hmm. um 
yeah, we, we, we might find um, another tool uh, for policy making in, in that field also. Uh, and that would so, be yeah. great. That would definitely be great. Yes, yeah. I, I, I agree. Um, I would like that. Then I would probably I'll... also live in a city for once. Let's, I can't handle that. It's just too loud all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's one nice thing about Netherlands. There's so much bike traffic that yes. usually is not that loud. But still, um, there's still a lot of cars around. But yeah, that would be a dream, for example, to say no more cars in the city centers because they're yeah. too loud. Yeah. <laughs> and then we would probably also have a lot of birds coming back because there's yes. There, there's a lot. Of, there's actually research on how the singing of birds adapts uh, in the if they're sitting in the li in living in the city, mm -hmm. how they become more loud or how they're changing the pitch of their voice. Yes. To be able to to actually still be heard because the city mm -hmm. is so loud that if they would continue with their normal singing, they they wouldn't be heard. <laughs> yeah. That's so again they, the they, point they, of the changing of the frequency a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So they are adapting actually to, to the acoustic environment that we are yeah. creating. And it's super interesting. One little side note on that. I watched a documentary and I was like, um, NASA was uh, taking sound samples of all the planets. And I was just thinking like, how the fuck are they doing that? But then it's like, okay, don't think about that. Just listen to the, the voice or the noise samples. And it was super fascinating uh, that they had the... Um, I would say now voice of the sun and other planets. And then they came to earth as the last uh, thing. Yeah. And it was so fascinating because I was like, that sounds like birds, what is happening? And then yeah. the person who was explaining that was like, if you think you just heard birds, that's exactly why birds sing that way. They are imitating the sound, the frequency of earth. And I was like, that is so fascinating. I was not oh, aware of that. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so since that- they did What's yeah. It? Yeah. Not the same. <laughs> that was like from that point on. I was like, "That's like Earth is saying good morning to me every morning when I hear the birds. It's amazing." <laughs> oh, that's a nice metaphor. Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think how they did that is they took the electromagnetic field of planets, that and, be. which is also a wave. And if you if you stretch that wave, I mean the frequency is a bit high, but if you you, you can stretch it to make it audible and mm -hmm. like transform it into a sound wave basically and then it becomes sound and since earth has quite a strong electromagnetic field the sound is quite unique of, of that planet fascinating now i know that too because they haven't explained that it's like oh i hate it when they don't tell that it's like you could give me any sound right now i don't know if you're correct that was the first thing that my mind did and it's like no just listen to the sound <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's described on their website how they did it precisely because I've also been there once. Um, I, I don't want to say something wrong, but I, I believe that's how they did that. <laughs> I would need to look it up, up. too. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, some homework to do as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pretty true, cool. <laughs> do you have uh, any books or anything you can recommend or pages uh, if people want to look more into that topic? Um. Yeah, relating to the discussion we had about uh, what is sustainable living now, mm -hmm. I can. It's not related to sound really, but it's uh, related to to <clears throat> an ecological lifestyle. As the book "Being Ecological" from Timothy Morton, mm -hmm. um, that's a very nice take on how the Western society can can actually find a new understanding and a new positioning in the world of perceiving itself as an as an ecological entity. And yeah, he has some nice perspectives on, on that. Mm -hmm. And then regarding sound, um, there's two books. They're like the, the classic books of, of sound research. Uh, one is the book, um, The Tuning of the World, uh, The Soundscape from Murai Shafa, the guy mm -hmm. I've talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit dry, but he's describing how the sound of the world has changed throughout the history And he's taking references also like in the era before there was ways of recording sound. He's kind of reconstructing how the world must have sounded like. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. And then there's another book from Bernie Krause, who's a, a field recordist. He's 
like I think he's also a musician, but he started field recording uh, early, like I think it was in the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. And he's recorded soundscapes all over the world. And many of them are not existing anymore right now. So he has a record of, of many places, how they sounded like before um, they got transformed into farms, for example. Um, and he wrote a book that's called uh, The Great Animal Orchestra, where he's also describing the concept of how the soundscapes of ecosystems have actually evolved throughout the course of evolution. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he has very nice perspectives on sounds in, in terms of ecology. That, that, that's a good one to read. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really good. Title also, great. Nice. Yes. I'll leave it to three books. <laughs> that's good. That's that's a good start, definitely. Then I already have my last question for you. What yeah. is your gift to the world? My gift to the world. Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, I think it's. I, I want to give experience. Mm -hmm. That's that's my goal. That I'm also trying to follow with the with the project that I've started right now about sound footprints um, is to generate experience that in the end can maybe generate a new understanding of something that we're mm -hmm. looking at. Um, because I believe if I'm listening to something, um, I can understand it in a way that I wouldn't be if I would read about something. Mm -hmm. So the experience of things in in relation to how we understand them uh, is, is I think is very crucial. For example, I can look at, at sound as, as a physical phenomenon. I can describe it in amplitude, frequency, um, pressure level, and a lot. there's a lot of things I could describe it with, but I don't know what it is until I listen it. Mm -hmm. So, um, or I could also say, love is just a molecule that's traveling through my body. But that doesn't make me know what it is. I need to experience that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think the the main thing I'm I'm obsessed with is generating experience in order to generate knowledge. <laughs> if that can be framed as a gift, I don't yeah, know. Definitely, it can. I really like that. <laughs> and imagining love as a molecule. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, you were explaining uh, really lovely about a sound or sonic footprint and that we have more insights about that topic now. Thank you for all your questions. It was a pleasure. <laughs> You're welcome.